Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. We're going to get started here in a few minutes talking about the Pope. I would like to briefly remind everybody that we will have a panel of speakers tonight with the Pope. And Charlie, who do we got on, on for the speaker panel? We have, we have keynote speakers. Uh, Mr. Steele uh, will be the primary one, followed by um, Dennis Nelson. And uh, where is he? Uh, Andy, Andy Anderson. Anderson. Hey. Then we'll come to Oh, oh, and Rosalie will get up there too. Though. So how much long for each time? About 15 well, minutes? Well, whatever. Whatever. Okay. Well, we'll whatever. play right Let here. Go. And then that. we'll follow by questions, and then it'll be the regular format. Hello, members of the I'm human species. Today. And anybody I'm else who may be paying attention. You notice I'm wearing a sweater tonight. It's because of this global warming. We're, we're, we're freezing our balls up in October because of global warming, just remember that. Um, now, it's in two months' time I'm going to be talking about uh, why there can never be a Marxist revolution. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the Pope and global warming. Charlie asked me to do this at short notice, and I, I think I understood him correctly. He said that I should try and keep it below two hours. So I'll do, I said I'll do my best, but I can't swear to that. Um, so... <clears throat> What, what have I got to say about the Pope and global warming? Well, uh, I have a message for the Pope of Rome. Um, uh, and it's from um, Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. And it reads as follows. Thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou yield in judgment to the opinion of the most part to stray from the truth. Now that's from the Douay Ram translation which has been traditionally favored by Catholics. It's actually still not very clear, although it's slightly clearer than what Americans call the King James <coughs> version, the authorized version. Um, <clears throat> what it says is, don't go with the consensus when the consensus is wrong. And in any dispute, don't side with the majority at the expense of the truth. So that's my message. To the, uh, now this guy, is, his name is Jorge Bergoglio. You know, Argentinians are mostly um, Italians who speak Spanish. And they mostly have Italian last names and Spanish first names. So he's quite typical, Jorge Bergoglio, uh, born and raised in Buenos Aires. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't call him the Pope, I call him the Pope of Rome, actually. Because um, although the Rom Roman Catholicism is the biggest sect of the Christian religion, it's not the only sect of Christianity that has a pope. There is another sect of Christianity that has its own pope. And that is the Coptic Orthodox Church. The what? Coptic Orthodox Church. Um, and the Coptic Orthodox Church has about 20 million members. It has three churches here in Chicago. I just looked it up. Um, its current pope is uh, Toadros II. Um, they split from the Roman Catholic Church in 451 CE, the Council of Chalcedon. Um, <clears throat> and the usual line is that they split over the personality of Christ, the twofold nature of Christ. But some, uh, I noticed that some people say uh, this was just an excuse. And the real reason that, the, that Rome wanted to get rid of them was because the people in the Coptic Church, which then was based in Alexandria, now it's based in Cairo, um, didn't want to become involved in politics. So there's a lesson there for uh, Jorge Bergoglio, who calls himself <coughs> Francis, the Pope of Rome. Um, <coughs> now, <coughs> the claim of the Pope of Rome to be the head of Christianity is based on Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, <coughs> In the New Testament's full of fabrications and stories made up for a particular purpose. And in the early days of Christianity, there were all these factions and sects which despised and resented each other and were struggling against each other. It's a bit like communism in the 20s and 30s. Oh, yeah. Um, the big difference, however, is that the Stalinists, when they got rid of the Trotskyists and then murdered Trotsky, uh, they could say, 
forever that uh, Trotsky was in the wrong. Whereas the, <clears throat> the Christians, when they came to write up their account of what had happened, they had to pretend that everybody had been on the same page from the beginning. Um, so, on this rock I will build my church. The, uh, the point here is that uh, Peter, or Petros in Greek, uh, means rock or stone. Um, there was a historical personage, apparently, whose name was Kephas, which means rock or stone in Aramaic. Uh, and this was the basis for the legendary Peter. Uh, so, it wasn't put into Matthew in order to justify the idea that the Bishop of Rome was head of the church, because that came later. It was probably put into Matthew at the time that Matthew was composed uh, to support the pro-Jewish wing in the Christian church. Because when the Christian church got going, there was a, sec a segment of the Christian church where if you became a Christian, you became a Jew. That's to say you were circumcised and you kept kosher. And you followed all the rigmarole of uh, Leviticus and, and Deuter Deuteronomy. Um, <clears throat> but there was another sect that was more um, outgoing and uh, yes. freewheeling, and that, that they said, get rid of all that stuff. So these were, the, these were two of the sects that were battling in early Christianity. So they probably put, Matthew is a pro-Jewish reply to Mark, which is pro-Gentile. Uh, so that's probably why they put that in. Um, the problem is with that way of conducting disputes where you fabricate a story and put it into a scripture, is that whoever has the last word is whoever has power in the church. And that was basically the faction that is represented by Luke, uh, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and here, you know, he makes up this story where Peter has a vision um, where God tells him to eat unclean as well as clean meats, and nothing is unclean. So in, in other words, you don't have to keep the Jewish law. And just to make it clear that, this, that there's no doubt about this, he has the vision three times in succession. So that should make it absolutely clear. Anyway, that's how, that's how the Pope gets his, um, gets his claim to the title. Uh, but it, of course, the, there's no historical validity in this. Um, Capas probably never went to Rome, and certainly didn't become Bishop of Rome. Um, that's just a uh, sort of fabricated story. Now, <clears throat> Bergoglio became, took the name Francis in memory of um, Francis of Assisi. And the thing everybody knows about Francis of Assisi is that he used to preach to the animals. Uh, now, this Francis preached to Congress. Uh, I don't know whether they understood any more of what he was saying than, than the animals did when Francis of Assisi preached to them. But um, <clears throat> it's part of the folklore of many uh, religions that animals can think and talk, if, but they just don't feel like it, which is why they never do. But occasionally they do. So you have like the snake, uh, who's responsible for talking human beings into committing sin in the Garden of Eden. And you have the ass, meaning the donkey, uh, of Balaam. Um, and in the Quran you have the same thing, you have ants who can talk and so on. Uh, these silly stories based on folk tales uh, are incorporated into these re uh, major world religions because the people who incorporated them didn't know any better. Well, <coughs> Francis spoke to the animals and uh, Pope Francis, the Pope of Rome, spoke to Congress. Um, and. Uh, when these news stories occur, you know, Bergoglio came to the United States recently and was shooting off his mouth about various things. And when this happens, um, the media, they, they, uh, they explain to the public, they have these little feature articles where they explain what's going on. Now, I may have missed it, somebody here can correct me, because I don't follow all of the media closely. But I didn't see anywhere where people pointed out that the Roman Catholic Church in the United States is collapsing. I didn't see that anywhere. I didn't see a feature article or a little segment on Fox News where they said, look, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States is collapsing. So I'm going to tell you, in case you didn't know. Um, now, as a matter of fact, six years ago, uh, I gave a talk to this august body, um, the College of Complexes, in which I argued that 
the secularization thesis is true. In other words, advanced industrial capitalism leads to the decline of religion. It was very fashionable six years ago to say, there was a guy called Rodney Stark who went around saying, and he had some followers, that religion goes in cycles and it never really declines. Uh, and that there is no truth in secularization. And I pointed out that uh, there has been a decline in religion in the US. People used to say, well, in Europe, people have become very irreligious, but that's not happening in the US. It's religion, religion seems to be uh, flourishing in the third world, but it flourishes in the US. And I pointed out in the talk I gave here six years ago that the United States until very recently contained within itself a third world country known as the South, and that religious enthusiasm in the United States is very much associated with the South. And now that the South has been industrialized and urbanized and modernized, uh, religion is dying in the South just like everywhere else. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just recently, actually, the Pew Research people produced, um, produced a new study. They do little studies of religion in the United States quite frequently, but they do this big survey of the religious landscape, as it's called. Uh, roughly every eight or nine years. Now, they did one uh, in 2007, and they did one in 2015. It's quite interesting. All religion, if you, if you define religion as meaning adherence to some kind of supernatural-based creed, is declining quite rapidly. Uh, but the Catholic Church, fastest of all. Um, <clears throat> so, between 2007 and 2015, um, the Catholic proportion of the United States population fell from 23.9 to 20.8 percent. What's interesting about this is that Catholics have a higher birth rate than non-Catholics, and two-thirds of all immigrants into the United States are Catholics, and they have an even higher birth rate than Native American Catholics. Um, <clears throat> So you would expect the proportion of Catholics in the U.S. population to be increasing. But in fact, it's falling quite sharply. Uh, for a long time, it seemed that it seemed to stay roughly around a quarter, 25% of the U.S. population. But now it's down to a fifth, 20%. Um, and that's happened in a few years. And it's going to, obviously going to continue. Um, <clears throat> Christians as a total pop of the U.S. population fell in that period from 78.4% to 70.6%. And the interesting there, thing there is that not only did Christians fall as a proportion of the population, they fell in absolute numbers. There are actually fewer Christians in the United States today in absolute numbers than in 2007. Now, the, you might think, well, what's the reason for this? Well, does it, is it because people are joining non-Christian religions? Uh, Non-Christian faiths, which is mainly Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism, uh, they went from 4.7% to 5.9%. So that's a big jump in terms of the 4.7%, taking that as a base, but it's a tiny increase in terms of the U.S. population as a whole. So that's not the reason why Christianity is declining and the Catholic Church is declining most of all. So what is the reason? Well... People of no religion, people who say they have no religion, has gone, in that period from 2007 to 2015, has gone from 16.1% to 22.8%. So that's where religion is declining. More and more people in the United States, it's just like Europe, uh, more and, it's, it's behind Europe, 20 or 30 years behind Europe, but it's just like Europe, that uh, more and more people just have no religion. Some of them call themselves atheists or agnostics, most of them don't. They just say they don't have any religion, they're just not religious. So the biggest drop of all there is among Catholics. And if you look into the closely what the Pew survey says, you see that if you interview Catholics, you know, they do this with all the religions, they say, how strong is your commitment to your religion? That's one of the follow-up questions. And the, the proportion of Catholics who say that their com commitment to Catholicism is very strong, has declined tremendously. Uh, actually, the proportion of Protestants who say their commitment to uh, the religion is, uh, is strong has maintained itself quite well. Um, 
And another thing is that the proportion of Catholics who have ceased, the proportion of, non, of Catholics who have dropped out of Catholicism and don't consider themselves Catholics anymore is much higher in the younger age groups. So basically, the Roman Catholicism is collapsing. And there is also the point I should mention that all over the Latin American world, including the diaspora in the US and other places, uh, there is a conversion from Catholicism to Pentecostalism, which plays a part in this. So, but in all ways, the Catholic Church is in a terrible state. It's in a crisis state in the United States. And they don't mention this uh, when the Pope of Rome comes to visit, um, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> So anyway, um, the Pope of Rome has come out in favor of the theory of climate change, or global warming, but they call it climate change because <laughs> they're getting a bit worried because the climate isn't changing in a warming direction. So <laughs> they give themselves a bit more room to maneuver if they call it climate change. It's a little bit more of a weasel phrase. Um, now, <clears throat> nearly 400 years earlier, of course, um, the, the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope got involved in a scientific dispute, and that was the Galileo, Galileo affair, and that was uh, over the question of whether the Earth or the Sun was the center of the universe. Now, the settled science 400 years ago was that the, sun, the Earth didn't move and was the center of the universe. Uh, <clears throat> there were a few people, Copernicans, who were skeptical about that, uh, and they were <clears throat> generally in, in poor repute, but they began to make, uh, with the invention of the telescope, they began to make some headway. A matter of fact, some of the Jesuits were quite attracted to this, uh, this new idea, that the Earth was moving, and the Sun was the center of the universe. Of course, we now know that neither is the center of the universe, they're both moving. However, um, <clears throat> the idea that the Sun is the center of the universe is a closer approximation to the truth than the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe. So it's an improvement, even though it's not true. Um, so um, <clears throat> there is a difference between um, the Roman Catholic Church's support for the Ptolemaic theory, the theory that uh, the Earth is, the center, is stationary and is the center of the universe, and their, su and their support for climate change. Uh, the difference is there really was a consensus in favor of the Ptolemaic theory. It really was settled science at the time. Um, uh, now, the, the, the leftist media constantly tell us that uh, global warming is settled science, uh, but they're not telling the truth. Uh, so that's a difference between global warming and the Ptolemaic theory. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one year ago, uh, I spoke here and um, <clears throat> I predicted that the global warming theory, the belief system of global warming, would be all over in nine and a half years. So it's a year later, so it's now got eight and a half years to run. Um, and um, everything is on schedule. Uh, the pause continues. You know, the pause is the lack of any warming. There has been no detectable warming, no increase in the uh, mean global surface temperature for the last 18 years. Keeps on pr prolonging. Um, and um, even if that was to cease, even if, the, if, even if the temperature was to start to rise again as it was uh, prior to 18 years ago, it still would be, a, unless it was to rise abruptly by a tremendous amount, there would still be a failure of the predictions of the global warming crowd connected with the IPCC, because they're not just saying that there wouldn't be a pause, they were saying that the, um, the increase in the um, mean global surface temperature would be quite dramatic, and of course it hasn't been. Uh, the predictions of the global warming people have always been wrong. They never got it right. Never once have they made a prediction which has come true. Every one of their predictions has been false. Uh, I qualify that slightly. Some of the models, they make predictions and they have a probability distribution. You know, there's, there's, it could be this or it could be that, and there's a range. Uh, now, some of the predictions have come true in the sense that the actual increase in global surface temperature has been within the, the range. It's been at the bottom end of the range. But it's never been close to the central values 
So, and that would tell anybody there's something wrong with the, the theory that makes those predictions. So the theory's been falsified by facts over and over again. Um, this started in 1988. James Hansen wrote a paper and it appeared before Congress. Uh, and, it, and that was the sort of breakthrough in public relations because it so happened there was a heat wave in Washington, D.C. when it appeared before Congress. And, but, 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 you know, the, the, um, people's mind, but politicians' minds are, are quite simple, as those of you who've been watching the debates and the Republican candidates would, would realize. Uh, they're not tremendously subtle people, and they thought, well, there's a heat wave, but yeah, it's all true. Um, and James Hansen in 1988 made three projections. One based on what's called business as usual, that's assuming that emissions of carbon dioxide are going to increase uh, at a fixed percentage, in other words, an exponential increase in carbon dioxide. Um, second, a linear increase. Uh, and third, the all increase in carbon dioxide emissions stops by 2000, and that he thought was the most favorable. Now, which do you think of these three is closest to what's actually happened since 1988? Obviously, there are no prices. It's the third. Although carbon dioxide uh, emissions have increased more, much more than Hansen ever imagined they would, uh, the actual results in temperature are closest to the third option. No increase whatsoever after the year 2000. So, this just, so in other words, it tends to corroborate um, the null hypothesis, which is that carbon dioxide has no effect upon world temperature, which of course I would uh, <coughs> suggest is strictly true. Obviously it has some effect. Um, <clears throat> now you keep on hearing that uh, we're about to have the warmest year on record. Um, that usually turns out to be false. But even if it were true, it wouldn't really support the, uh, the catastrophist theories of the global warming crowd. Uh, that's because the record only goes back just over 100 years. And we, the last couple of hundred years, we've been coming out of the Little Ice Age, rebounding out of the Little Ice Age. So there has been some slight increase in global temperature over the past couple of hundred years. Um, the position of the skeptics is that climate sensitivity is low. Climate sensitivity is the response of temperature to an increase in carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, the position of the, um, <coughs> the catastrophist is that climate sensitivity is high. Now, this is, it keeps being investigated, and all the results keep coming in. Every month or so, there's a new paper which shows that climate sensitivity is low. So everything's on schedule. Um, and um, I still maintain that in eight and a half years, everybody in this room will accept, well, that was a piece of silliness, what preposterous nonsense that we ever believed in this uh, global warming stuff. Now, <clears throat> the Pope of Rome claims to be a friend of the poor. Um, what do the poor need? They need economic growth and cheap energy. So the Pope of Rome is an enemy of the poor because he supports uh, this um, global warming ideology. Uh, the object of the global warming ideology is to make energy more expensive uh, and to uh, halt economic growth. So the only hope of the poor uh, is going to be snatched away uh, by <coughs> um, at the, at the wishes of the Pope of Rome. Of course, he's, 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 I don't think he hates the poor. Um, I think he's, he's just objectively, uh, he's sincerely deluded. Um, and uh, he, he's um, objectively an enemy of the poor <coughs> because he favors uh, controls on um, <coughs> use of fossil fuels. Now, if you do favor, if you do think that there's something in the catastrophist hypothesis, despite the fact that I keep pointing out to you uh, how hopelessly bad it is at, at, at when confronted with the facts, then you ought to be in favor of the only viable alternative, which is nuclear power. But very few of, the, very few of these global warming catastrophists are in favor of nuclear power. Uh, they're opposed to that as well. So what they want is windmills, which kill lots of birds and bats, and have to be subsidized by fossil fuel production in order to get them to run at all, because they can't contribute any net energy uh, to the economy. Um, now, I must say that um, the Pope of Rome does do something to combat global warming. I'm quite serious. I'm quite serious about this. He is doing something to combat global warming, and that is he wears a white hat. 
Um, because <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but if you wear a white hat, you're going to cool the earth. You're going to have a cooling effect. This is basic physics, right? Um, there's something called the greenhouse effect, and the greenhouse effect <coughs> obtains because the atmosphere of the earth is more transparent to shortwave radiation than it is to longwave radiation. Uh, the sun, uh, millions of miles away, is blasting out photons in all directions. Most of them are shortwave. Uh, most of them are in the realm of what's called visible light or sunlight. Actually, no light is visible, but it's visible in the sense that it enables us to see objects. <laughs> it makes objects visible to human beings within that range. So visible light, sunlight, uh, is the main. There's also ultraviolet, but that, we can leave that aside. Visible light, white light, sunlight, comes down on the Earth, and uh, it passes through the atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, with, without too much um, <coughs> uh, problem. But if it hits something white, like ice or snow, it bounces <coughs> back, and most of what bounces back goes back into space. So the bigger the albedo, as it's called, the bigger the white area that's on the Earth, the cooler the other things being equal, the cooler the Earth will be, because more of this will be bounced back. Now you say, what happens to the stuff that doesn't bounce back? What happens to that? Well, it's absorbed and then it's re-emitted as long-wave radiation, what we call heat or infrared. Um, and basically, whenever you, something's warm, but not glowing, uh, it's infrared. What we call heat is basically infrared. Um, and <clears throat> this is why we have a greenhouse effect. Uh, it's because the atmosphere is more transparent to short-wave than to long-wave. Now, anybody who puts up anything white especially if it's brilliant white, it's got, it mustn't be dirty white, it must be brilliantly solid white, uh, is bouncing this shortwave radiation back off into space. So they're cool, helping to cool the planet. So if you really want to do something to combat global warming, you should wear a white hat. And that's what the Pope does. Um, <clears throat> now, um, it may be fortuitous that he does that, uh, but... Um, if you wear a white hat, is that going to make any difference to the climate? Well, theoretically, it must make a difference. Um, just like emitting carbon dioxide, theoretically, must make a difference. Uh, does it make a difference that anybody would ever be able to detect? No, neither of those things are going to make a difference that anybody's been able to detect, or is it? <coughs> Certainly, no one has been able to detect them yet. Uh, so, um, but, it's all, but remember, if somebody tells you that global warming is basic physics, Remember to tell them that if you wear a white hat, you'll cool the planet. That's basic physics too, okay? And the Pope wears a white hat. So um, he is combating global warming. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to wind up shortly. Uh, I, promised I'd be, I promised I'd be brief, and this is me being brief, okay? Uh, I will just say this. Um, if, uh, I'm not, I don't believe in, in, I'm not convinced there's a God. And I certainly don't believe in the Christian God who has multiple personality disorder, right? There's three of them. Uh, and it's difficult to keep which of them straight, right? I don't believe in the multiple personality disorder God of the Trinity. Um, uh, so, but however, purely as a consultant, I can look at the Catholic Church and see things that it might be doing right or wrong. Purely as a, in terms of trying to maintain itself as an organization. And I would say this, quite seriously, that if you're an organization that represents a belief system, it's not helpful to bring your message more into line with whatever's popular or fashionable at the moment. It may seem as though that will be true. And the Pope, this, this Cardinal uh, Bergoglio, has been surrounded by all kinds of uh, rich, rich uh, people who tend to, elite kind of people who tend to believe in things like global warming and all sorts of other politically correct nostrums. And they keep telling him this, and he thinks, oh, I'll go, this is pleasant to please these people. I will say this, come out with this stuff, even though I haven't personally cracked a book on atmospheric physics. Um, and, you know, and so there is this idea that if you're pleasant and if you, if you minimize differences, uh, that's going to be good for your organization. But if your organization 
it's, if its rationale, if its raison d'etre is to, that it has something distinctive to say to the world, then of course uh, you're losing that something distinctive if you try to please everybody. So I think even though in the short run, what it means is that the left let the Pope off uh, a lot of criticism because of what he thinks about same-sex marriage and things like that, because of his support for, uh, for the global warming theory, uh, in the long run, it's not good for the Catholic Church to try to please everybody. And I do believe, by the way, that over the next 50 years, you'll see the Catholic Church compromising on birth control and compromising on same-sex marriage and com compromising on women priests. Uh, and you'll see splits and divisions in the Catholic Church as a result. So I don't think um, <clears throat> that it's helpful. And I come back to Exodus 23, 2. Thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou yield in judgment to the opinion of the most part to stray from the truth. Thank you very much. All right, next. Uh, let's see. Dennis, who's, ne yeah, who's next? We have an open mic. We want our next speaker up here. Let's welcome Dennis Nelson. I am Dennis Nelson. I'm one of the original modern energy environmental conservation activists ever since around the first uh, birthday celebration, which was Wednesday, April 22nd, 1970, over 45 years ago. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology and Environmental Studies from Adana College in Blair, Nebraska, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I am the Vice President of Nuclear Energy Information Service here in Chicago, NEIS. Our website is www.neis.org. And um, I am rallying with uh, Pope Francis and other religious leaders to the call to take immediate moral and ethical action for climate justice. I made a sign for the NATO protests in Chicago that uh, was a big hit. Nuclear free equals climate justice. We've already passed the level of uh, 400 parts per million for carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. We must halt and then reverse this trend ASAP so we can get back down to the safer level of 350 parts per million the level of CO2 that existed when life began and evolved on our planet. Pope Francis doesn't see nuclear power as a solution to our, our climate crisis. In his 192-page uh, encyclical letter on the climate and environmental crises afflicting planet Earth, published on June 18th of this year, Pope Francis didn't list nuclear power as a solution. In fact, he cited the threats and risks created by uh, nuclear power, as well as nuclear weapons. And we've talked about this before here at the college, that nuclear power and nuclear weapons are directly uh, connected. The concluding sentence of the 20th paragraph in Chapter 1, What is happening to our common home, Section 1, Pollution and Climate Change, seems directly relevant to the position that nuclear power is a false solution to our climate crisis. Quote, technology which, linked to business interests, is presented as the only way of solving these problems, in fact proves incapable of seeing the mysterious network of relations between things, and so sometimes solves one problem only to create others, unquote. Uh, Pope Francis sees nuclear power as the modern-day Tower of Babel. In an audience with Japanese bishops on March 20th of this year, Pope Francis criticized nuclear power by comparing it to the Tower of Babel. When human beings attempted to reach heaven, they triggered their own destruction. Pope Francis said, quote, human beings should not break the natural law set by God, unquote. This is probably the first clear-cut criticism of the commercial use or the civil use of nuclear power issued by the Vatican. Quote, the destruction of nature is a result from human beings claiming domination over the earth, unquote. 
With these statements, Pope Francis referred to the Fukushima nuclear disaster that started on March 11, 2011. Fukushima was a human-caused uh, disaster compounded by an earthquake and a tsunami. Soon after Fukushima began, the Japanese Catholic Bishops' Conference publicly demanded that the Japanese government immediately shut down all of that country's uh, nuclear reactors. The nuclear priesthood of Alvin Weinberg. As a longtime no nukes uh, environmental activist, I have held a position that going nuclear free is superior to going nuclear because of the serious, unresolved social, political, and moral ethical liabilities posed by nuclear power. There is a topic along these lines which was not covered during my previous two presentations about nuclear thorium. This topic is too important and too good to pass up a third time. Nuclear physicist Dr. Alvin Weinberg was head of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and he invented, as has been pointed out here, the experimental prototype non-commercial molten salt liquid thorium reactor. I want to re-emphasize that. It was experimental, prototype, a non-commercial uh, design. Dr. Weinberg was one of the more thoughtful nuclear advocates, actually. In his own words, he said that nuclear power would require more or less perpetual surveillance because of the longer-lasting radioactive wastes. Well, in 1974, Alvin Weinberg publicly discussed what kind of social and political institutions would be necessary for our social stability if we opted for an all-nuclear electrical economy. Uh, Dr. Weinberg concluded that safeguarding nuclear power and its longer-term rad waste would require a nuclear priesthood, a technical elite. This unleashed a firestorm of controversy among environmental nuclear-free activists because our eyes were opened up for the first time to a whole new problem. It was a new problem back then, posed by nuclear power. Well, from 1972 to 76, I went to college at Dana, I mentioned, and I was in biology and environmental studies department. And during my senior year, 76, I did my presentation for readings in biology and environmental studies class about nuclear power and included a discussion about Alvin Weinberg's nuclear priesthood. Well, when I was the energy analyst resource person for, uh, bread, for the Breadbasket Alliance in Omaha, Nebraska, I coined the term pro-nuclear hanky-panky to characterize the dishonesty, lies, uh, cover-ups, and deceit of the nuclear enterprise. In other words, it's nuclear deception. Pro-nuclear hanky-panky would go right along with a nuclear priesthood. A technical elite uh, given the task of protecting and promoting nuclear power. And this is the way that it has been since President Dwight D. Eisenhower started his Adams for Peace program under the secrecy of the Atomic Energy Act. Now we come to the radioactive waste from thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle. Which happens, which happens to be the title of my first presentation here at the college about this topic. Rather than solving the rad waste problem, the use of thorium either in the light water reactors fueled by uranium that we have now, or a new molten salt liquid thorium reactor would only perpetuate it. For example, Let's look at the irradiated reactor fuel, which is, in other words, the high-level uh, radioactive waste. The radioactive thorium-232 contained in the irradiated reactor fuel rods itself uh, will be uh, very long-lived with a half-life of 14 billion years. The radioactive fission byproduct called technetium and I mentioned that before in my other two presentations, that's another radionucleotide. Technetium-99 has a half-life of about 211,000 years. Okay. On Sunday, May 11th, 2014, Germany got a record-breaking 74% of its electricity from renewable sources, with wind and solar providing most of that. In fact, electricity prices dipped into the negative for much of that afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I've been to uh, the great state of Alaska twice during the summertime with my late mother. 
um, July of 1993 and July of 1995. Alaska is already experiencing the negative impacts from human-caused climate cha chaos. I prefer climate chaos or climate disruption, David, to either global warming or climate change. And a report uh, published in January 2009 by the Alaska Energy Authority set the goal of producing 50% of the state's electricity from renewable sources by uh, 2025, including hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, ocean, and solar. Now, if Alaska can do this, why can't Illinois? Well, let's look at France. This is supposed to be the pro-nuclear uh, poster child. France want, plans to reduce nuclear power from 75% to 50% of its electricity by 2025. France will be generating the other 50% of its electricity from renewables by uh, 2025. France will also be cutting its 2012 levels of energy consumption in half by uh, the year 2050. Mark Cooper, senior fellow for economic analysis at Vermont Law School's Institute for Energy and the Environment, did a 50-page report entitled Renaissance in Reverse, Competition Pushes Aging U.S. Nuclear Reactors to the Brink of Economic Abandonment, yeah. July 2013. Uh, David, both you and uh, Tim really need to check that report out. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's really excellent. And what it does is what he did was he outlines 11 economic risk factors that could lead to the earlier closure of our nation's nuclear power plants. These factors include failing, uh, falling, sorry, falling electrical demand, safety retrofit expenses, rising operating costs, and lower cost energy alternatives such as wind and solar. Now, Exelon's Quad Cities and Clinton nuclear stations here in Illinois might be closing if electricity prices don't improve. Exelon stopped supporting uh, wind turbines after they became less expensive than their, than their nuclear plants. Um, I'm going to give uh, Andy and uh, the speaker a, a, a chance for just a few things about David's presentation. I did a rebuttal presentation on human influence climate disruption to your presentation you mentioned earlier. Dr. Jim Hansen's middle scenario has been proven to be correct. If anything, the climate models by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, have underestimated the uh, rapid rate of Arctic uh, sea ice melting. And data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has shown that recently we have had, we have had the hottest years on record. All you climate deniers and delayers do is just you like to cherry pick your data. So I'll turn it over to the other speakers. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank next you. speaker, please. Our next speaker, Andy, get up here. Yeah, no cherry picking data. Let's get our next speaker up here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We want the physics, Andy. Which I like 15 minutes. Yeah, something like that. Don't worry about it. Tell it right away. Go get him, Andy. Well. Set my timer up just in case. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, you start talking about a subject, <clears throat> 20 minutes goes by and say, what happened? You just lose track of the time. Uh, <clears throat> you start thinking about stuff. Um, I run with my brother uh, the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. Ours is a database translation service. We take books, uh, 10, 15, 20 books on a subject, a wheelbarrow full of paper, <clears throat> and translate that mass into a, a one-page cliff note so that somebody can read in five minutes. Because there's no time. If you give somebody a wheelbarrow full of paper and say, you got two minutes, what's in there? There's no time. <clears throat> so if, there, uh, if a database is building up on a subject in the major media, is not covering it, the public is unaware 
that a thousand scientists have published reports on that one particular subject, or two thousand. <clears throat> like, uh, for example, uh, there's 2,700 uh, scientists and doctors in one group called the Scientific Group for the Reappraisal of AIDS. They've been publishing articles, papers, books, videos since 1987, spelling out what is now known to be solid, documented, worldwide reality on the subject of AIDS. HIV is not the cause, AIDS is not sexually transmitted, AIDS is not infectious or contagious, and the anti antiviral drugs were what was responsible for the 90% of the death toll. Now that, what I just told you is one of the three most radioactive subjects in America, what I call the trillion dollar golden triangle. If you try to talk about any piece of that research documented uh, Nobel Prize winners publishing books, you mention it on the airwaves in America as a journalist, you get fired and blackballed instantly. Your career goes into the buzzsaw. There's a book out, we'll talk about it three weeks from tonight, <clears throat> along with its companion book to Censored News. Christina Borgeson wrote a book called Into the Buzzsaw in 2004. It describes the method where uh, 18 Pulitzer Prize winners, they all had good long careers, and one day they, they thought they would uh, enlighten the American people on a subject, whatever it was, and they got fired and blackballed. So she put that those stories together, uh, like uh, the bovine growth hormones in milk, how it affects the development of children. Uh, that's a subject you can't talk about on the airways in America, or you can get fired, because the dairy industry has huge clout. Uh, our media is owned and operated by billionaire predators. People that and have on certain subjects, they have no discernible ethics, morals, and conscience. It's just good business to go for the money. So um, if it's profitable to keep the American people in the dark about something, they will do it. It's a, this book, Censored News, uh, Project Censor has been up and running for 37 years now. And uh, it describes the journalism school in Sonoma State University is uh, supported by journalists from other uh, schools around the country, professors. They send stories to Project Censored, and they call it down to the top 25 that would change our country overnight if they were covered rather than intentionally blacked out by the media. The media aren't just missing these stories. You call up a talk show and say, I'd like to talk about this. As soon as you get the words out about which subject it is, your call would just be cut off. You never get on the air. There's a seven second time delay for radio talk shows, so there's certain things that never even make it onto the air. And with the major media, major newspapers, television, newspapers, uh, radio, it's a two-pronged process. They promote the myth on all channels, 24-7, and they simultaneously run a coordinated blackout. It's not, they're not missing all these scientists that are saying, hey, global warming is real. Uh, you know, there are certain segments in this country now that buy huge advertising time to give like three scientists airtime to yes. say global you warming is the myth, global warming and climate change. Yeah, the other 987 scientists with credibility, <clears throat> they don't get on the air that much. But that is changing. There's a growing global consensus about the subject of global warming. That's just one of the, the topics that the Pope is addressing. Uh, the Pope, as Dennis talked about, there's, there's overwhelming evidence that we're in the final stages of what Professor John McMurtry called the cancer stage of capitalism. That's the title of his book, uh, came out of Canada in 1999. He said, unregulated capitalism, uh, the billionaire predators will get bigger. And if you let, let billionaire predators rise to the top and you don't regulate them, they will become like huge sharks. They'll eat everything in sight and destroy a country and other countries too. And that is exactly what we are seeing around the world right now with the billionaire predators that own and operate the coal, oil, gas, nuclear, what Harvey Wasserman calls King Kong, for one thing. Um, there's a cartoon in... Uh, 
a cartoon from 1983 from the Illinois Safe Energy Alliance. They published a newspaper. There was a, a, a rich oil man, uh, you know, sitting behind a camera. He said, <clears throat> "You want you want uh, coal? We own the mines. You want oil? We own the wells. You want nuclear power? We own the uranium. You want solar power? We own um, the, the rare solar earth. is not feasible." The rare earths. <laughs> so uh, we have been subjected in America to a 30-year coordinated blackout by the media on the fact one fraction that I talked about with the seventh graders, 10,000 to one. That's all you need to know is 10,000 to one to understand what solar means. 10,000 times more energy falls on us every day than what the human race uses all over the planet. We collect one ten thousandth of the daily solar intake with affordable solar cells that are here now and spreading all over the world, you don't need any coal, oil, gas, or nukes. And Harvey Wasserman published a book called Solartopia in 2007. It said, look back from the year 2030. Take a trip across the country in a hydrogen-powered airplane and look at what they did with what they had in 2007. He said, the people realized in 2007, that's eight years ago, nothing new needed to be developed. We have all the materials, tools, technology, everything we need to convert the country to a non-petroleum country by 2030 with uh, mobilization driven for profit. Going solar and wind power is vastly more profitable than going nuclear. The idea, the idea that nuclear power can make any contribution to solving the global energy crisis is one of the most persistent, corrosive, toxic waste pieces of mythology that has ever been promoted on a population anywhere. <clears throat> Bertrand Russell uh, wrote once, he said he grew up with a poem. A poem was sung by people a little ditty back around 1900 when he was growing up. He said he always remembered it. He said it goes, a dog, a wife, a walnut tree. The more you beat them, the better they be. Uh, we've come a long way uh, from the time when it was thought you could beat the evil spirits out of a sick person, or uh, spare the rod and spoil the child to the point where a lot of kids grew up being abused. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of the truth. When my brother and I work with something called the Galileo learning curve, Galileo was first. He published the truth. The earth revolves around the sun, but he got arrested and prosecuted for it. People came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. So today, you can't have a good debate on whether the earth is flat or round. 30 years ago, you could get into a fist fight if you asked somebody to put out a cigarette next to you in a restaurant. People would say, I have a God-given light to write up and puff away anywhere. Light up and puff away anywhere. It's a God-given right. Your, your right to clean air has uh, no bearing on this. We move forward. You know, uh, in our lifetime, it's become totally unacceptable to have lynchings and leave people hanging in trees as an example to the rest of the population that was getting out of line and thinking they had human rights. That was uh, happening back in the late 50s, early 60s in the South, until the public reached critical mass and said, hey, this is wrong. Today, there's jokes about our Pope, the, you know, the Catholic, said, the Pope is out there saying we can't worship money anymore. You know, what does this world come to? The Pope is out there talking about the principles of Jesus, so we should help the sick, help the poor, uh, help the less fortunate. He said, what does this world come to when the Pope is actually out on the campaign trail talking about the golden rule and uh, uh, helping uh, dispel the immense economic inequality we have all over the world? Uh, myself, I think it's, I like him. I think he's a breath of fresh air. But I'd, like, I'd make this observation. Um, when the situation, especially with capitalism, when the situation is greed has gotten so far out of hand that even the Pope is out there saying, hey, it's time to look at this, then this should be a big 
wake up call for everybody. Yeah. Every you know, where we've in the last forty years, America has gone from a land of opportunity to being pushed in toward a police state where the middle class is being eliminated. And Proposing building nuclear power plants is not going to help lessen the inequity. What will help is uh, affordable jobs, promoting new technologies that actually help the environment. Uh, we have the ability to mass produce everything that's needed to help solve the problem of climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it. Incidentally, if you log on to a website called Common Dreams or Truth Out, they publish updated articles from NASA, James Hansen. Uh, our speaker is absolutely right that none of their projections were ab ab actually correct. Their projections each year, uh, the global warming projections, the, the, you get better and better data, and they said the ice caps are melting, the sea level is rising faster than what we predicted. It's not 100 years away anymore. And this prediction we thought would take 50 or 60 years, well, we might be there at 20. The numbers, the science is not certain as to which year it's going to be solid because there are so many variables in the climate. What is solid is that it's 99% certain that we're on the way to global climate change and global catastrophe if we don't have a World War II type mobilization a global mobilization in a handful of years. Take that trillion dollars we're wasting in Iraq and Afghanistan guarding the oil pipelines. For those of you that think uh, the troops are fighting terrorism over there, that's, is there a bell ringing here? No. Uh, that's another one of the popular myths we'll be talking about in three weeks. One, another segment of the golden trillion dollar triangle. Our troops aren't fighting for freedom and justice anywhere in the world. We've got bases in 135 countries. It costs $2.1 million to keep a troop in Afghanistan for a year. Take the money for that troop in Afghanistan, bring them home, give them a Harvard education, and give away 43 hybrid cars with the rest of the money. Okay. This is how our tax dollars are being wasted. A trillion dollars a year down the military rat hole to roll with the idea that we have to defend oil and gas and resources all over the world. I'll close with... A couple of uh, observations that have stuck with me all these years. There was a famous song, I don't know if any of you knew it, uh, back from 1965. A man named Tom Lear wrote a song called Who's Next? But there was a, uh, one of the lyrics in there was, Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? It's not my department, says Warner Von Brown. With, <laughs> who's next? We'll, we'll try to stay serene and calm. When Alabama gets the bomb, who's next? The spread of nuclear power, the spread of nuclear weapons all over the world is fueled and driven by the spread of nuclear power. In 1967, the nuclear priesthood recommended the best safety reactor uh, safety record we could hope for is one meltdown, one major meltdown in every thousand years worth of service. Well, somebody asked them, uh, said, well, don't you have to you know, plan on having more than 1,000 reactors running on American soil by the year 2000? Man says, yeah, yeah, that's right. He says, what does that mean? Well, the guy says, this is 1967. You have to understand that America is overpopulated enough. But America is going to be overpopulated enough by the year 2000 that the public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. They, the, the best scientists in the nuclear priesthood thought our country could absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity. That's what we're dealing with when we're talking about politicians and billionaire predators that own and operate these companies. 1983, Robert Cheer published a book called With Enough Shovels. Thomas K. Jones, the Under Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Operations, was flying around the country giving high-level briefing meetings with major business leaders, the movers and shakers, teaching them there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. You dig a trench out back of your house, throw a couple of doors on it, leave a hole to crawl under it, and you, 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 you pile up at least three feet of dirt on the end of that trench, 
you sit under that mound of dirt as the radioactive cloud drifts over, it'll protect you. It's the dirt that does it. This man wasn't in an insane asylum somewhere. He was in President Reagan's cabinet. He promoted the same kind of insanity then that people are promoting today, saying that nuclear power is going to be some kind of our savior. It's the same exact out of touch with reality thinking that comes from not studying okay. real world evidence while you're living inside a, a mythological bubble generated by the major media. The last thing I'll leave you with, in 1960, our government had a plan. We had, uh, the Defense Department had a plan to unload 3,200 nuclear warheads on 135 Russian cities, and we would win a nuclear war between us and the Soviet Union. 132 warheads would make Russia unlivable. By 1985, the 12,000 pound bulk that was dropped on Hiroshima, that blast power had can can condensed down to something the size of a football that you could okay. carry around in a purse. And the scientists, they knew in 25 years, they learned enough about radiation and human health to know that one bomb exploded in a city would exceed the medical capabilities of the Northern Hemisphere. I'll be, I'll be quick. Okay. This is it. Well, uh, since, ever since 1985, with the spread of ComEd's power plants and everything else, the one fact they've been blacking out is that nuclear weapons material comes out of the nuclear power industry. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Plutonium is not a naturally, naturally occurring element anywhere on Earth. What can you do with a 12-bomb war? Well, they figured six bombs in six major cities, six bombs near nuclear power plants scattered into the wind. A 12-bomb war, 12 bombs delivered in knapsacks on motorcycles would make America uninhabitable for humans. A 12-bomb motor, motorcycle war. Okay. In other words, Kawasaki lets the good times roll. All right. That's where we are. And people, we've been ignoring the reality of this since 1985. And we, we, we continue to ignore these realities at our peril. And we're not going to get our country back at all until okay. we address what's okay. in this, this pamphlet here. It's 9-11, it's called The Great Illusion. We have to stop living under the All illusion. Right. All right, Andy, we got to get you. You got to get one speak, final speaker on. Okay, we got time. No, I would suggest we probably skip rebuttals tonight, our questions tonight and go right into rebuttals after our last speaker. Because I know a lot of people Thank are itching you. to get up there. Right. So get our last speaker up. Hi, I'm Rosalie Regal. I've spoken here a couple times um, about Dorothy Day and about um, those who engage in civil disobedience, particularly against nuclear war. Tonight, I'm going to speak about our topic, the Pope's actions in talking to Congress. That's what we're supposed to be talking about tonight. I'm going to be concentrating on just a couple things because of the things I know best. Um, but I want to say a couple things about the, um, all the marvelous stuff we've been hearing about or not hearing about on global warming, and that's the Pope wrote a huge encyclical called Gaudiana Say, all about climate change. It's the only encyclical I've ever read, and I didn't read all of it, it's 91 pages, but I read quite a bit of it, that is written in concrete language. Because the Popes, God bless them, usually write about stuff that is so abstract that you can't understand what they're talking about, or that applies to everything and nothing. Gaudiana Sei is not that way. It's very specific. Just as Pope Francis was very specific in what he talked about to Congress, I didn't expect much from that talk. I went to um, exercise instead, and I got out, <clears throat> got out of the health club and my phone's ringing off the hook because the Pope mentioned Dorothy Day. You could have knocked me over with a feather. You could have knocked every Catholic worker and most of the left Catholics in the United States over with a feather. 
the fact that Pope Francis signaled out three radical pacifist Christians to bring to the forefront to demonstrate what he thought America could be. I mean, I was shocked. I'm still shocked. I'm still sort of reeling with the fact that people now, when you say the name Dorothy Day, a lot of people aren't going to go blank like they've been going for the last 30 years, ever since I met her. You know, people usually just, you, you who know her, um, realize this. They say, Dorothy who? Doris Day? <laughs> because the Pope mentioned her in this terribly hierarchical church, in this terribly hierarchical world of ours, people will know Dorothy Day. There is now a good chance and I'll be real glad to take questions about this, that she may be canonized. That the Pope's mentioning her in such a public place um, may really go a long way towards furthering the cause of her canonization. But that's not what I want to talk about tonight, although I will be glad to answer questions because I am on the Historical Commission for moving that cause along. I want to talk about the radicalness of Dorothy Day, I think, and also with Peter Moore, but more of Dorothy. I think people know how radical Martin Luther King was and how his nonviolence actually did, in fact, make some changes. Not enough, but make some changes in the way we treat black people in America. Dorothy Day would love that title of the book, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, because she was not a capitalist. She was anti-capitalist. And it's really one of the things that's upsetting about this week and the fallout from the Pope's mentioning her in Congress is that Dorothy Day has now become a cannon fodder in canon in the culture wars that are taking place between the right and the left in the Catholic Church. Our first speaker spoke quite eloquently about the collapse of the Catholic Church, and I think if he means that there's not going to be very many Catholics, he might be right, but I'm not sure that that's a collapse of the church. And in this, I think I'm speaking, I'm kind of channeling Dorothy because she wrote in National Catholic Reporter, or interviewed and was quoted in National Catholic Reporter about questions about the corruption of the church because it had so much property. And I will quote. I'll look up my quotes. In 1970, um, she was interviewed by National Catholic Reporter, and she was talking about the church particularly. And in a box, what did they call that, by the side of the article, they had a quotation, which actually she didn't say, but the quotation said, our problems stem from the acceptance of this lousy, rotten system. What Dorothy actually said about the rotten system was in an article she wrote in her Catholic Worker newspaper in 1956 when she said, we need to change the system. We need to overthrow, not the government as the authorities are always accusing the communists of conspiring to teach to do, but this rotten, decadent, putrid, industrial capitalist system which breeds much suffering in the whited sepulcher of New York. So when she gave that famous quote about filthy rotten system, she meant capitalism in the first place. When she was paraphrased as quoting it, that was in 1956, in 1970, she was in fact, as my friend Brian Terrell pointed out this week, um, criticizing the church in its marriage to that system. Um, and I will quote, 
She mourned the condition of the Catholic Church. She said, I feel that over and over again in history, the Church has become corrupt, so corrupt, it just cries out to heaven for vengeance. The crisis is something terrible. And then she was um, uh, talking about the reduced vocations, the closing of churches and everything like that. And then she said, closed buildings and abandoned ministries might be a purification of sorts, as if the Lord is taking into hand something we can't do ourselves. And then NCR says, do you think it has a great deal to do with the property that the church has? She said, I think it's a result of the corruption of the institutional church through money and through their acceptance of this lousy, rotten system. So there she was very clearly separating the church, wanting to separate the church from the system of capitalism. And now I don't know whether the Pope read that, but the Pope was very consciously choosing Dorothy for her nonviolent anti-war stance. And one thing that I've been really kind of upset that people haven't picked up on is how he called on the U.S. to quit selling arms to absolutely everybody in the world, our enemies and our friends. I mean, we sell to everybody so they can kill them, kill each other, you know. And he called on that, and nobody's picked up on that. A few people have picked up on what he said about nuclear war and nuclear power. And of course, we do have some Catholic activists, people who are still proclaiming themselves as Catholic, who have done plowshares actions, nonviolent civil disobedience against nuclear weapons, particularly the uranium producing facility at um, Oak Ridge was the latest one. I think the Pope knew what he was doing when he mentioned Dorothy, mentioned Martin Luther King, and mentioned Thomas Merton. It wasn't too long ago that the bishops of the United States were sort of trying to write Thomas Merton out of, um, yeah. you know, they took him out of the catechism and he was kind of a non persona non gratis um, for several reasons, but he was probably one of the first clergy to come out against the Vietnam War. And he had a very important um, meeting with Tom Cornell of the Catholic Worker, Dan Berrigan, Phil Berrigan, both priests at the time, Paul Yoder, Paul Yoder, um, a few, three other prominent um, Protestant clergy who were anti-war. And if you want to hear more about it, um, the Merton Society on, oh, I forgot the date. It's October 17th, I think. That, can you look up the, that Sunday? Um, anyway, it's that, that weekend, Sunday. I think it's the 17th. Um, Gordon Oyer has written a book about that important meeting. It predated the Bergens coming out against Vietnam War. It predated most of Dorothy Day's coming out. The fact that she wasn't invited is just an example of how um, patriotic, patriotic the church is, because Merton and Dorothy were in correspondence at that time against the war. But she was not invited to that important conference that was kind of the basis of the radical Catholic left during the Vietnam War. What's that Sunday? Just look up the, the Sunday that, I think it's the 17th. I'm just doing oh, right. okay. What, what, which one is it? Uh, it's the Merton, there's a Merton, the Chicago Merton the Society is meeting Saturday at. Saturday is the 17th. Okay, so it's Sunday the 18th okay. at 3 o'clock at, um, I, can, I can send Charles the stuff. I'm sorry, I was speaking at it, and I'm sorry I can't remember where, where it is, but I know how to get there. Um, anyway, the Pope talked about these three people in particular, and Abraham Lincoln, um, because he wanted to show the people of the United States the way to go forward. He wanted to show the people of the United States 
that they need to stay out of war and stop arming the world. Um, he, when he was in the States, he didn't do everything that I loved. And I have to say, I've only had two popes in my life that I have felt I could call my pope. I would talk about the pope. You know who the other one was? John the 23rd. John the 23rd. And then there was Limbo Land, and I thought, well, there'll never be another John the 23rd. This pope is something else. He's a definitely a leftist, and he is probably going to cause a split in the church, which I think we were talked about earlier, because the far right, the, which controls Congress, um, and many of them are Catholic, are um, openly saying things that I was criticized for saying for, like, oh well, you don't have to listen to the Pope, that kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, so we are going to see big divisions because this Pope is a prophet. And as Dorothy said, maybe that's not so bad. But he didn't do everything um, that I was in love with. He met, he was sort of bamboozled into meeting with that woman that won't um, give same-sex marriage licenses. And the Vatican today finally kind of came out with a statement. They finally traced down how it happened. I think it was a nuncio. Um, some right wing DC person worked this um, Kentucky County clerk in, and the um, Vatican clarified that the meeting should not be seen as a show of support by the Pope for the clerk. He also that same day met with a former student of his and his partner, and I think he would probably say the same thing. You know, those were private meetings, um, and um, the Pope asked to meet with his former student. He did not ask to meet with the Kentucky County Clerk, and it should not be considered a form of support of her position in all its particular and complex aspects. Because I think the people on the right are taking the Pope's call for freedom and putting it into this kind of spurious freedom of um, religion, which means that they don't, you know, pay any, that they're against Obamacare. And I don't think the Pope intended that, and I'm sure he felt pretty bad um, at all the fallout he's gotten from that. Okay. The other thing that the Pope and I disagree on is um, women's ordination, and there was some civil disobedience. I don't think it got too much play. But two of my best friends, including one of them that I was in her office, or in her house, staying in her house when I fell and broke my back last year, um, laid down on the street in front of the Pope's cavalcade to um, protest the fact that he won't ordain women, or that the church won't ordain women. So expect to see some changes, but not while I'm alive on that. Um, I'll be really glad to talk in the discussion period more about Dorothy, more about why she and Thomas Merton and Martin Luther King were maybe the root of Pope Francis's um, speech to Congress and um, how we can bring that up and so it doesn't get buried in this welter of culture wars. Thank you. All right. All right. Charlie wants about 15 minutes of questions. Oh, I just wanted to say, here's my book if anybody wants to buy it. I would like to get all four of our speakers up front so we could get, answer our questions and we'll let Brom... Well, I can't say where they're at. <laughs> Uh, Charlie, let's right. get them up front. All right, all right. Our four speakers up front, please. That way I can film you. If you're in favor of nuns getting arrested. All right. <laughs> we now, we're going to put a, we're going to be putting a time frame of Someone 15 minutes on this question Charles. period. And uh, I would like to ask the first question. I oh. thought, okay, I thought the Pope's central message was something called the Apostles' Creed, which reads, uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived in the Holy Spirit, so on and so on. 
Now, what I heard tonight is a lot of misinterpretation or not nothing even near that central message. Can some of you guys comment, please? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the, this Pope is pursuing a program of uh, replacing Christianity with political correctness. And um, uh, I, didn't, I, I, listened to, I didn't listen systematically to everything the Pope said, but I listened to quite a bit of it. And I didn't hear the bit about the gospel. Um, you know, that was, uh, that was something that sort of dropped out somewhere along the line. Okay. So I, I think we're, you know, we're, this, I think this is, we're witnessing the general collapse of the Catholic Church, I think, as, a, as a, or an organized denomination in the world. It's, it's going to take another hundred years for it to run its course. But, um, uh, yeah, I think there was, there, was, there was nothing about the gospel in um, what the Pope said. Any other comments from our other speakers? I think uh, one one thing that I, I you know it has struck me. Oh, sorry. Uh, the thing about you know the the Pope's uh, what he's been talking about the last you know months, he's talking about issues of human universal human problems uh, that are facing humanity right now. The real critical, the global problem of the you know the collapse of predatory capitalism. The collapse of uh, religious doctrine, in other words, people are uh, you know looking for answers, and uh, you know uh, I think the Pope is doing better than any other Pope I can remember in trying to address issues that are of critical importance to humanity right now across a wide spectrum of things. You know, and you can't cover it all in a half an hour, an hour, but you know, he's, I think he's doing a fantastic job. Okay, Dennis. You, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't think he was thinking particularly about the Apostles' Creed. I think he was thinking about the Bible, and particularly Matthew 25, um, feeding the hungry, burying the dead, releasing the prisoners, those kind of things. That's the human rights things that the Pope was speaking to Congress for. The, Blessed be the peacemakers. Okay, Dennis. Well, it's a good question. I'm a person of faith as well as a person of science. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the uh, Methodist Church, now United Methodist Church, and I mentioned in Omaha, Nebraska, I had very good friends, um, Catholic social activists, who I who I worked with on a variety of issues. I picked the stuff about um, climate and nukes because if they've decided if I'm going to be right. representing NEIS, that that's the way our organization is. We're non-religious, a, a, we're non-religious, we work with uh, anybody, um, Catholics, um, Protestants, uh, Unitarian Universalists, anybody that wants a nuclear-free future. So the context of my presentation is what I've spoken about before. I, I, support ecological stewardship and that's what the Pope's basic message is in the encyclical that I mentioned and that's a, the, the part of my belief are you've got the good values okay. as well as the sound science to back them up. Okay. Right. Uh, next question, Charles. Yeah, I'm reading the Pope's speech here and he says, oh, we need to limit and direct technology. Now he's a theologian. Do you think he should be setting the U.S. national policy on our technology? Well, I think he's in, just as entitled to his opinion on that as anybody else. And, uh, you know, it, it, certainly he can, he can say what he likes. Um, and I don't think that, I would never say there's anything wrong with him having opinions and voicing them. Um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't agree with that opinion. Um, uh, and I don't agree with some of his other opinions, um, but uh, there, is, there is the point, you know, that um, Paul um, didn't form a committee to abolish slavery. In fact, he said slaves obey the masters. Um, you know, the, um, the early Christian church was not a movement of social reform. Uh, it's come a long way. Now, I would be gratified if the Pope was to, was to be in favor of laissez-faire, personal liberty, free markets, and so on, because that's my outlook. And if he was to be an atheist, because that's my outlook too. But, you know, the question is, why, why is this religious institution 
doing this? Um, and, uh, and is it good for this religious institution in the long run to do this? Uh, I think there's a, there's a question there. By the way, um, we should be clear that the papacy has never been in favor of free market capitalism. Uh, and, you know, if you go back in the encyclicals, the Rerum Novarum of 1891, Quadragesima Anno, Anno of 1931, um, they're, they're very much against uh, laissez-faire capitalism and also against socialism, against both, and in favor of some kind of middle way. Um, so it's never, been, it's never been a part of, uh, of papal social teaching uh, to be in favor of capitalism in, in a pure form. Uh, so there's nothing new there. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Who else got a comment? All right. I'll, I'll, All right. I'll make a Next quick comment. Question. Uh, Charlie asked yes, you, you uh, what was your question was about limiting technology? The Pope recommends that we we he says we have to limit and direct technology. Now this is a theologian speaking, and I'm. Does he have qualifications or authority to, to make such recommendations? Well, he's widely recognized as an authority figure for a lot of people, a moral authority figure. And I think he might be talking about uh, the, the need, the very real need to limit now the technology of the killing machinery that's being produced by the American military industrial complex the technology of drones and everything else, as currently stated, the American military is the largest killing machine on the planet. And who else better than the Pope to come out with authority and say, uh, it's time to start limiting and doing something about this technology. People just think it's great to make profits and who cares how many people die. And it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong on, on many issues and the Pope is addressing it. And that's, that's what I think partly what he's talking about. Right. Next I think question. Dennis had oh, Dennis. You have a comment. Yes. Well, the one thing I'll agree with David here this evening is that the Pope uh, is entitled to his opinion. Yes, he does have a right to speak out. We need to look at the moral and ethical implications of technology, whether well, it's uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, genetic engineering, or whatever it is. Uh, Dr. John P. Holdren is Obama's chief science and technology advisor. He's one of the smartest environmental scientists around. He has degrees in aeronautical engineering and plasma physics. He has said that technologists are necessary to clarify issues, answer questions, but the broader questions, the public policy questions, require the greatest amount of public input from the widest range of people. And that's exactly what the Pope is doing. All right, next question, please. Yes. Rebuttals. David? No? All right, then let's go to rebuttals right uh, away. Uh, yeah, uh, I saw on TV Naomi Klein, who I think wrote, uh, this changes everything. I think she said she was an uh, advisor to the Pope. So uh, I don't know if anybody else saw that, but I'd like to hear uh, some comments on that. Uh, how that book and Naomi Klein's ideas relate to what the Pope had to say. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, I haven't read very much of Quadrigism Gaudiamus say, but I think it was probably very definitely. Um, influenced by what he read of <coughs> Naomi Klein. Um, I've heard her speak, but I can't speak nearly as clearly about climate change as some of the other people in this room can. I'll make a quick observation. You asked, uh, is, is it possible that Naomi Klein was advising the Pope or helping his, uh, his information input? If he is uh, getting information from her and some of the other good climate scientists, I would uh, send my congratulations and, uh, and keep, encourage him to keep doing so because he's on the right track. Uh, the, you know, the Pope obviously hasn't got time to read 20 books a week either. And uh, you know, if it's not in the news, you wouldn't know it's happening. 
And so uh, Naomi Klein's book is a, among the top 10 on describing climate change and uh, what can be done about it, along with Professor David Ray Griffin's book, Unprecedented. That book is filled with solutions of what people, it's a whole chapter in, in the, about uh, church involvement uh, from the Pope on down, church involvement all over the world on combating climate change. It's in the book, Unprecedented, by David Ray Griffin. So yeah, I think the Pope is really on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see the thing about Naomi Klein being an advice to the Pope, but it, but it sounds good. Um, I have a inside phone sales and telemarketing background. I'm not anti-capitalistic per se. I am against unbridled <coughs> capitalism, what I call rape and pillage capitalism. That's what the Pope was 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 about. Um, Climate disruption is uh, probably one is the biggest market failure because we haven't taken into account the what economists call the externalities we need to be putting, for example, like a price on carbon. Uh, so, um, his response is that um, you know if she is advising the Pope and he is paying attention to what she's saying, uh, more power to him. Okay, David, you got anything to add? All right, at this yes. point. Any, uh, I'd like to go to rebuttals if we could. Um, All right, we're open to rebuttals. I'm going to go All first. All right, let's take our speakers. Uh, hey. Somebody wish to make rebuttals. One, two, three, four. Did you give me a catch? I got it. Jim's got it. Oh. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I got my uh, And Jim has oh, want, race to be first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How many of you remember that old Monty Python skit? Well, well, let's begin by thanking us. Oh, yes. yes. I, would, I would hate to be the Pope in this crowd because he would be subject to. Ah, Nobody expects the College of Complex Inquisition amongst our most adamant diverse weaponry. Ah, a loose elaboration of the truth. A, a twisted elaboration of the leftist values upon Catholic fundamental face. And three, fear. And four, surprise. And no, one of the ones we don't do are not ruthless efficiency. Ah, the College of Complex Inquisition. Perhaps, maybe. I should be listening. Thank you. Yay! That's your question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ron Bentag. I um, would like to go back to the first thing our speaker said tonight when he uh, introduced himself. He's, I think he uh, introduced himself to human beings. Okay, real quick, five minutes, okay? To human beings. And the thing about human beings is we have the capability of so solving problems. And I think that's generally what's there in the Pope's intention and all of our intentions here. But I think we also have to actually bring real science into the question. So I'd like to just say a couple of things in, in light of the discussion tonight. One, our organization, the uh, Executive Intelligence Review of Lyndon LaRouche, just uh, put out a report. It's called Global Warming Scare is Population Reduction, Not Science. And what is that's based on is that in any question of human beings and, and, and development, the question is not just energy, it's energy flux density. So if you look at the history of the biosphere, you look at the history of mankind, it's an increase of relative potential population density based on an energy flux density growing. So you need technology, you need higher and higher forms of energy, and you can go to what's based and laid out in these kind of manipulated frauds of global warming, you actually end up with a energy capability that won't support more than a billion people. So whether the Pope knows it or not, he's actually talking to that kind of reduction of the population, I think it's what people should actually look at, at some of the advisors the Pope had. And one of the ones people can talk to about a little later that's not mentioned is a fellow by the name of Hans Schellenhuber. The, Hans Schellenhuber, the, the Queen's top analyst, if you want to call it that. And he's the guy that had hands-on operations. He's now in the Pontifical Society writing this encyclical. So the question here 
is how do you actually get to real science? And we had people like Burton Russell quoted when the real scientist in the, the period at the time is Einstein. We have Galileo quoted as some kind of scientific figure, an observation, and not Kepler. The problem is the dumbing down of the population. And we face a situation today where you look at a collapse of uh, Wall Street and the derivatives. There is a solution in front of us. There's a world already moving for that solution with the BRICS nation, as LaRouche has been leading. And you have before the Congress a bill to put Wall Street through bankruptcy reorganization with Glass-Steagall and build their way out of this. And we keep spinning our wheels in a mathematics, as Russell would say, that's flawed. And if we actually come to our senses and apply real science and development, we can train our kids again to think, which means we've got to change the culture out of this nonsense back to a real classical form. So I'll leave it at that, but um, people should get on LaRouche's site, LaRouchePact.com, look up this report on Schellenhuber and his role actually playing the, um, the church here for uh, real suckers. Now, you go back and you look at encyclicals, and I'm a former student of the Catholic priesthood. I put 10 years into the seminary I left at minor orders. And if you look at the encyclicals from, Louis, from Leo XIII to the present, they all put mankind, the human being, at the center of God's creation and the continued development. And this encyclical takes a break from that for the first time against it. So it's off. And Sean Hoover is the guy you should snuff out here in this British population reduction policy. Okay, next. All right. Ron. Okay, Brown, five minutes. All right. Where to begin? Uh, the, uh, the Pope, our uh, present Pope, uh, representative of uh, a school uh, of Christianity, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, the Jesuits, uh, from his background. Uh, he uh, has been uh, very refreshing as a, uh, a pope uh, to us Protestants. <laughs> uh, and, He's uh, approached uh, uh, with humility and uh, with grace, uh, with forgiveness, uh, a host of uh, problems uh, that uh, uh, people are confounded by in our society. And when it comes to global warming, uh, he uh, views with alarm. He says it's not something to, to be dismissed, but to be studied and to be acted upon. It's a moral question how we deal with populations having to move, whether it's from wars and uh, uh, famines or uh, from uh, other reasons. Uh, these are serious moral questions, and he wants us to study them and address them. Uh, and uh, he says that uh, since uh, millions of people are going to be affected by what uh, a consensus of scientists say uh, is uh, the uh, global warming and its effects, uh, large we, we do have to prepare. Uh, we do have to raise a different culture that welcomes immigrants. And not only in the United States, he did speak to the United States Congress about immigration uh, and immigrants and being an immigrant himself. Uh, he, he tried to think, put things on a personal, uh, moral uh, basis, and to uh, speak to the uh, to the common uh, feeling of of uh, people, common morality. 
that we generally accept. Uh, and, uh, and I think that he was uh, very successful in uh, uh, winning uh, the attention and uh, the sympathy of uh, millions of people. And uh, for this, I, I was thankful. Uh, uh, I think that he'd have more difficulty and perhaps not enough personal light uh, to uh, a, a wage a war in the Roman Church of, against uh, the paternalism that freezes uh, uh, women with vocations out of their vocations to be priests and uh, uh, theologians and uh, uh, administrators and so on. Uh, uh, sometimes there is a little room and we keep crying in the church, churches <laughs> uh, of Christ to uh, uh, make a little more room for uh, people and for mercy. Uh, but it's a difficult uh, uh, labor, uh, whether in the church or outside the uh, visible church. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just thankful uh, for uh, what grace uh, was exhibited. Uh, in the uh, early on in Christianity, uh, I believe it was King Constantine, he saw that, uh, that the uh, uh, Christian religion was becoming very popular and in spite of the Roman persecutions. And so he had himself baptized and became a Christian and made Christianity the order of the day. Uh, there were a number of books in the Christian religion that he had thrown out. So they picked and chose what uh, books they wanted, put it together and said, this is the Christian uh, religion and this is what we're going to go with. But the truth of the matter is that I don't think they really believed in it at all. I think they just used that for the purpose of the Roman government. And that Catholicism, or at least uh, the Vatican, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, is, is really the, what we have left of the Roman Empire. Uh, I believe at the hello, I believe at the core of uh, of the Catholic order that they uh, don't believe in any of it. Uh, it's about uh, charlatans and dupes, very much like socialism or communism, which also are religions. And if you pin down the communist or the socialist, they themselves will tell you, we can't prove it. You have to accept it on faith. And when you have to accept something on faith, you're being asked to accept a religion. Uh, I want to make it very clear that I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I support capitalism. I extol capitalism. And I despise and loathe communism and socialism. Thank you. Next. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I don't think I can put this together in four minutes, but I guess I'll Five. try. Uh, in community organizing, there is an idea 
that power is the ability to get things done. And there's two kinds of power in community organizing. Organized people and organized money. In spite of the fact that we talked about the environment, in spite of the fact that we talked about the uh, Pope, I think this is apropos. Because there are certain people, I think, uh, who believe that progress will go on forever and that the real value is the value of money and wealth. Uh, in community organizing, you usually look at the other end and you say, the real value, what the hell are we here for? And that is probably people. When you put environment in there, you get another issue. But I know that there are some people that are, uh, say, ultra-capitalists that really can't stand the idea of global warming and all that it means. It means, hey, uh, progress may not go on forever. We may not be able to make money, more and more money, at everyone else's expense forever. This is a scary prospect. I think the Pope uh, is speaking to that. Believe me, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. I hardly ever have anything good to say about the Catholics, I'll say that. But I think this is really the issue. The issue is are people and what they're living on the earth of value or is wealth really the value? I just think the, some of the speakers spoke to that and I think the uh, Pope uh, also spoke to that. Thank you. Raj Patel. My name is Raj Patel and I speak for my, myself. Uh, about a month ago, the first time I went in a park in the afternoon and sat down on a bench, little literally other young men came and sat down and started reading the book. Somehow we got in a conversation. And after an hour and a half conversation, he said he has to go and get your email. I said email. And uh, he sent me, when I went home, there was email. And he says that he's 22 year old, he wants to start investment business with his friend. And he says, first time somebody talked about me and myself and my life seriously. And that person, I do not know, and he's three and a half times older than me. See? Somebody touched somebody. What Pope was doing is that he was touching millions of his faithful, and that, and that was the important message. Issues are there, but when you see in a crowd and you see the faces, and you feel that they feel so good. And uh, Pope was reaching out and telling young people that, hey, I understand the issues you talk about. It doesn't matter whether the issue has a impact or not, but uh, because he's not going to go and make a law on, on a climate change, but uh, he did something that he said you make young people feel good. He, about uh, gay rights, he said he cares, he knows the issue, he cares, that was important. Whether he 100% agrees with it, not, he cannot probably, because he, worldwide opinions are different and he had to balance that. And I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Christian. And uh, I'm not too much fond of Christianity per se, theologically. But I think you have to admire that a man has made a difference and he's trying to reach out as many people as he can. And uh, he's doing great job. Where I found a fault was that about that canonization. Because, because Catholic Church should deal with uh, is uh, killing the people for a conversion of faith. And that has happened in India, that has happened in Africa, that has happened in America. And that might have happened in Latin America. But Pope, this Pope we got is better than we have had before. Thank you. All right.
like the Pope. Make him the Pope of India, right? I would like to touch on something that I felt very uncomfortable with and that has not so far been commented on this evening. And I grant you that I do not know what the speaker's all intentions were when he used the phrasing that he did. And it's possible to dismiss my concerns as political correctness. I don't think it is, but if some people want to do that, that's up to them. When I heard the words, and I speak as a Jew, when I heard the words Pope of Rome mentioned, that took me back, in my his, in the, oh, using the historical research I've done, back a hundred years or so, when there was a very snide, very vicious anti-Catholic movement here in this country, which frequently referred to the Pope as the Pope of Rome. And I don't know, I think we can do without that kind of terminology, period. Uh, I applaud the Pope's concerns with Pope's speaking out as he did. Popes have spoken out for hundreds of years about issues that they felt were of concern. And this is one Pope who, in his comments, uh, reflects the concerns of a great many people, many of whom are, of course, Catholic, and many of whom are not. The last Pope we had, and this was touched on earlier, who was able to speak to that kind of an audience, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, was John the 23rd when he opened Vatican II. And so I applaud the Pope for speaking out on concerns like global warming and on, need to, on a need to help the poor and on his criticism of the immigration policies uh, around the world and not just here in the United States. And we once had a president here in this country. And that president, and we were speaking earlier of the great national effort that's needed to deal with global warming and how we need a World War II effort. We made such an effort 50 years ago to put people on the moon. And that president's name was John Kennedy. And President Kennedy, I, it has come to my attention recently, far from when we hear candidates uh, who are talking about building walls. Well, President Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy, instead of building walls, they tore them down. And not only, I speak not only of physical walls, but John and Robert Kennedy, instead of building walls, tore down the psychological barriers that divide people. And we could use people, more people like that now. Um, thank you. We, we got some time, Charlie. Oh, all right. I only have to rush again. I have to thank all of our speakers. It's time enough to be good in this. And thank you for your uh, diverse remarks. I'll be eclectic as usual here. I think he was just the Bishop of Rome. I don't know if it's a big deal. It's not the Pope of Rome. He's, because there's all kinds of bishops, right? And he's just, whoever happens to be the Bishop of Rome happens to be Pope. I think that's what they're talking about. But I'll leave it up to you practicing Catholics. Because I, I don't have any dog in the fight. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, I, I even wrote Rosalie because I listened to the, I don't know why, but I listened to the Pope's speech, and when I heard him mention Dorothy Day, I knew we were in for some action here. Uh, I actually, 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 I think it was I who took my late companion Lois to a meeting of the Catholic workers about Do uh, Dorothy Day, which is unusual. I said if they were hated by mainstream Catholics, they probably sound like a group I might want to learn more about. <laughs> but uh, And then I don't know anything really about, I like to study philosophy, theology, I know little or nothing about. But I do know enough that Thomas Burton was somewhere on the fringes of the, <laughs> of the uh, mainstream um, theologians and authors. And I, I said, this is rather intriguing here. Um, but then again, here you've got a guy 
who is invited to speak to the United States Congress. And we have 17 candidates for president of the United States for the Republican Party. And they're pretty clear. Each of them has just about the same position. And here's a guy that comes along and gives a speech. And he gets a big crowd, let me tell you. Um, and he tells them all that free market capitalism is no good that they should be real nice to immigrants and not round them up and do other things to them and that we've got to take action immediately on global warming. I said, boy, this is going to go over really well. Um, needless to say, he's kind of correct. Um, but yes, he's given a little lifeblood to the saints and hopefully he's elevated the, the level of conversation on these topics from this uh, right-wing hysterica that's taken over at least one political party in the United States. He also said something else, the Pope said something else that struck my attention. By the way, the Catholic Church is not going to go away. I'm not the champion of this, but they've been around about 2,000 years, a little dip in membership, whatever. Um, it's a worldwide institution. It does not significant. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If I was Catholic, I wouldn't be worried. At, you know, Merley, um, <laughs> because we're thinking there's not going to be church on Sunday. Um, but he did say something here that I found rather interesting. He said, "Watch out. We have to watch out for every type of fundamentalism." And I never thought we had to be guardians against fundamentalism. Religious fundamentalism is usually considered something of a virtue. And I guess I began to say, is there such a thing as political fundamentalism, like libertarianism, or something like that? And I said, yeah, I could see I, it's a good idea to be afraid of this, from taking, um, from embracing this, these kinds of notions. I, it's kind of interesting. The other thing I was asking, and asking you guys to people, what is the proper application of technology? Is how he framed the argument, which is rather interesting because I was thinking, and you are advocates, and the one just left here, he's telling you, I am a capitalist, and so forth. But has there been any application of free market capitalism, and I ask you this, Tim, that has not done damage to the environment? since the inception of the Industrial Revolution in around 1800. Everywhere the technology has been applied in free market economies, it's left a mess. And the guy is entirely correct. Maybe you ought to put a check on technology. I don't think he's any kind of person opposed to progress. But he says you've got to direct your progress, which I think is an interesting perspective. Um, I think this is a very pragmatic guy. He didn't steep this stuff in a lot of theology and a lot of what I call mumbo jumbo or woo woo among the Indians. He looked at the serious problems and he looked at some of the directions that we have. And the historical analysis, I guess, is entirely correct. Anyhow, I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. We have something up to date. Um, <coughs> I think we're going to hear more out of this individual. Uh, it's, it, and it's not steeped so much into reform of the, their church or reform of their clergy. I don't know. Those are pressing issues, of course, to your friends who are nuns and are excluded from the decision-making process. Um, also, he seems to be directed by some of the the things that I think have captured the Roman Catholic faith, these, this reproductive issue and things like that, and maybe given a little larger perspective to things that there is more than one issue. And I don't know, we need to really put a hierarchy to them. Anyhow, thanks a lot for what you okay. gave, and look forward to your rebuttals. Thank you. Gonna go. You too, Brad. Go. Somebody's been here? Go ahead. Yeah, the Pope is against, is with the Greens, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a hat just like mine, you know. We still need a Pope, George, and a... Uh. What
One of the uh, speakers uh, pointed out that uh, the uh, Pope's uh, comments before Congress uh, had absolutely nothing to do with the Gospel. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. In the first place, uh, the Gospel is not a suicide pact. It was written for, by, and to the benefit and enlightenment of mankind. It was not intended to be uh, something consigning all of us to doom, gloom, and suffering. It is how it has been applied over the centuries where we have seen far too much doom, gloom, and suffering. Someone asked uh, tonight, what scientific background has this Pope got? Well, in fact, he has several degrees in science. He was a trained chemist. Uh, he is a theologian. And uh, during his college years, he earned part of his keep as a bouncer in a nightclub. This guy rocks. He does not take any merd from anyone. He is probably one of the most interesting, even if you're not a Catholic, even if you're not a believer, he is probably one of the most interesting figures to grace the international religious scene in a long, long time. He keeps coming up with surprises that set all of us, Catholic or not, to thinking. About uh, eight months ago, the subject of gays came up. And he said, who am I to judge if they are seeking God? Um, I guarantee you, no pope uh, over the past few centuries would have dared say anything like that. I mean, we have had some popes who were considered fairly liberal. Uh, I couldn't picture John the Twenty-Third saying something like that. This guy did and subjected himself to a certain amount of criticism from the extreme right-wing, conservative wing of the Catholic Church. When this man was first elected Pope, a friend of mine and I were watching the whole proceedings and we knew a little bit about the man's background, and she said to me, I hope he has a good food taster. <laughs> because these are the kinds of people that cause members of the Roman Curia to have kittens. For those of you who don't know what the Roman Curia is, it is a group of cardinals, and I'm not saying they're an evil cabal or anything like that, but a very entrenched group of cardinals who in effect run uh, the church government under the direction of the Pope. Many of these guys are some of the greatest minds of the 12th century. <laughs> Others are real progressives. <laughs> they get sent <laughs> on assignments to the third world. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot happening here uh, in the Catholic Church that amazes even many Catholics. We certainly never expected to see a man like Francis following a man like our German shepherd, Benedict. <laughs> now, Benedict was a great theologian, a great philosopher. He was referred to in polite circles as God's Rottweiler. <laughs> he was the head of the uh, branch of the Roman Curia, which was responsible for doctrinal conformity. The office that he headed was the same office headed uh, uh, by people like Torquemada about four or five hundred years ago, except for the fact that they don't burn anyone for heresy today. They simply kick them out of the universities where they speak and teach. Uh, you're seeing a whole change in Catholicism and in religion in general. I have had friends who were never Catholics, never had any intention of becoming Catholics, asking about this man, asking about the Catholic Church. And they, it's, it's set a lot of people thinking. Uh, but more importantly, he set the world to thinking. 
because he's raised the issue, for example, of global warming, which apparently half the country doesn't want to uh, recognize that it exists, and the other half of the country wonders when we're going to realize that it exists before it's too late. He's a guy that's speaking about it. He's spoken about nuclear weapons. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, it isn't just the clergy, it isn't just the peace activists that are concerned about nuclear weapons. There's a precedent for this. We know that there is fallout, pun intended, from nuclear weapons. However, you may recall that in 100 years ago, during the First World War, the horror weapon of that time was poison gas. Poison gas was killing almost as many of the people that were shooting it in the directions of the enemy, uh, you know, as anyone else. So they decided to do what? They formally and informally banned the use of poison gas. The last time poison gas was used in a legitimate, you know, war, uh, a major war, uh, was during the First World War. I realize in the Middle East some dictators there have, have used it, but it, in terms of it being part of a general war, major nations have not used it. They recognize the dangers, they recognize the horror. The same thing is true with nuclear weapons. The problem with nuclear weapons, and the Pope has touched on it uh, at a time when I think many people would have been afraid to, the problem with nuclear weapons is that once you explode a nuclear bomb, there's an awful lot of fallout that's going to kill an awful lot of people that you don't intend to kill. More importantly, you create an opportunity for countries which ought not to have nuclear weapons to have them and use them. I don't want to say irresponsibly because I can't think of the responsible use of nuclear weapons off the top of my head, but uh, I'm sure after a few beers I'd probably uh, think of it. The truth of the matter is, this man is causing people to think. This man is causing people to argue. This man is causing people to demand changes. We're seeing it. He's only been in office about two years, and he has already brought about a revolution which most people, I think, never expected to see happen in their lifetime. Previous speaker over there talked about uh, women's ordination. I'm not saying that it's going to happen tomorrow. But I'm saying that if anyone sets the course for that eventually to happen, it will be people like this. Look at the cardinals that this man has appointed. Okay. He's not building change during his lifetime necessarily. He's putting in cardinals who in the next generation and the generation after that, those are the ones that are going to make the changes, the big changes. And we're, we're seeing this. We're getting it at the ground floor, as it were. This is a fascinating period in history. Uh, and it is, fortunately, uh, not as fascinating or as bloody uh, as the Crusades or the Inquisition. What it will have is major a change on the history of the world and the history of religion in general, never mind just Catholicism. Uh, what we're seeing here is a uber re reformation. Um, Thank you. All right. Our four speakers, closing remarks. Our four speakers, closing remarks. Our four speakers, please get up. Closing remarks. Please limit it to... Uh, Okay, Dennis, we'll give you each about three minutes. Thanks for all the rebuttals. Uh, I agree that we need to use our ingenuity and creativity to solve our problems. I just don't agree with the Lyndon LaRouche approach. We should be using ecologically oriented market-based policies and truly sustainable technologies to make our world more livable. Rather than being one of LaRouche's bizarre conspiracy theories, uncontrollable and runaway climate disruption will be the ultimate way of inhumanely reducing the world's uh, population. 
We have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. Let's continue to put mitigating our carbon pollution first, followed by adapting to the negative effects already happening, and keep suffering to a minimum. Studies have shown that we can power the entire planet with renewable resources by the year 2050. The most recent one was done by Greenpeace International. The real science is a 97% consensus by the climate scientists actually doing the research that our activities are largely responsible for the heating that the Earth is experiencing right now. This consensus has been attacked this evening, but it's not been refuted. Finally, eco-refugees are going to be a major concern in the future. If sea levels keep rising, and we don't take action now to substantially cut our climate disrupting pollution. If Bangladesh is flooded, where are the people going to go? India and Pakistan will not want to accept them. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Next. Go ahead. I'll be brief. I think the folks speaking to Congress has helped a lot of people to do what he's been trying to do, and that's to look at the other, to look at the one who thinks differently than they do, to maybe think, maybe there's another way of thinking than the way I've been thinking. Um, Dorothy Day was a convert to the church. She was always um, known as a, quote, loyal daughter of the church. But she always criticized the church when she felt it didn't do the right thing. I think the Pope is doing that thing too. He has um, appointed the most liberal priests he can find to be, for instance, the Bishop of Archbishop of Chicago. He'll probably be a cardinal soon. There aren't very many bishops like that around anymore. Most of them have died. So I really hope that the future cardinals will be able to carry on the work of Francis, but unless they ordain the women, I doubt it. Thank you. All right. Andy, and then you. Here's a quote from uh, Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu. Is he related to the Catholic Church? He's no. an Anglican, not a He's Catholic. He's what? He's an Anglican. Okay. Anyway, uh, I think Desmond Tutu is pretty famous, isn't he? Yes. He says, if we don't limit global warming to two degrees or less, we're doomed to a period of unprecedented instability, insecurity, and loss of species. Our religious communities must speak out on the issue from various pulpits. There's a whole chapter in this book uh, called The Religious Challenge. Uh, and the Pope is quite superbly bringing this issue of, you know, all of our, our issue on uh, climate change especially, but uh, as Naomi Klein pointed out in her book, This Changes Everything, the failure of capitalism to address these issues is the issue of our time. I feel um, Professor Griffin and the others talk about people that are adults now, all of us. Future historians a couple hundred years from now will look back on us and they will say, we are the greatest generation that ever lived. We're either gonna go down in history as the greatest success for rising to the challenge and solving these problems, or we're going to be, go down in history as the greatest failure ever of people that had overwhelming evidence and sat and did nothing. And the last thing, uh, I like the quote from uh, way back when people rode horses. They said, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Remember that one? Well, in the age of cruise missiles, if you don't shoot until you see the eyes of a cruise missile coming in, you're seconds away from being vaporized. 
things are happening faster and faster in today's world, we cannot wait until the sea level is up about eight feet and encroaching on Manhattan to determine that yes, the science is overwhelming. Science is overwhelming in their estimate that global warming and climate change are absolutely real, absolutely happening, and we have to address the issue of why some people live in a state of denial. So uh, for that, I, I cannot speak highly enough for the Pope for calling out people in Congress and everywhere else saying uh, it's, it's time to address the issue of denial and uh, it's a moral, religious, ethical issue to uh, talk about the, the great issues that are, are facing humanity right now. I think the Pope is doing a tremendous job. Thank you. Yeah, the idea that um, it would be terrible if uh, warming goes above two degrees is a bit irrelevant because there is no indication that, that the future warming over the next couple of hundred years is going to be anything like as much as two degrees. I wish it were, I wish it was higher, but the, there's no indication of that. Uh, we, we, when we talk about warming over the past 50 years or so, we're talking about, we're talking in, you know, tenths of a degree. Um, and, um, no warming at all for the past 18 years. Um, so, um, two degrees would be wonderful, but I don't think we're going to get it. Uh, <clears throat> but the main thing I think that comes out of all this is uh, what is the role for a religious body uh, pronouncing on things that are not intrinsically religious? Um, what it seems to me is that, you know, there was a time in the history of the West when the Catholic Church either had supreme power or had power, the secular authorities gave the Catholic Church power over um, everything that didn't involve immediate day-to-day -day government policy and sometimes even under that. So, it, you know, the Catholic Church ruled Europe. Um, then you have the Reformation, and when the Reformation started, the Reformed churches wanted just as much power as the, as the Catholic Church had had. So Calvin in Geneva and the Lutherans in, in northern Germany and Sweden and so on, they had just as much power. In fact, they were more intolerant than the Catholic Church had been uh, initially in the first um, hundred years or so. Um, uh, but gradually this broke down and you had places like Britain where there were Methodists and other dissenters from the, the established church. And then you have the United States where there was, was no established church. By law, there was no established church. And so it was, there was a free market in religion. Um, now, what comes out of all this is, what is the role of a religious body when you're talking about scientific issues? And what I would say, or, or issues of public policy, what I would say is it's very clear that the religious bodies have nothing distinctive to offer. All they can do is go along with secular trends. Um, so whether, whether the global warming catastrophism is correct or incorrect, I think it's incorrect, but even if it's correct, the, all the Roman Catholic Church can do is either oppose it or support it. This Pope has chosen to support it. Uh, there is no distinctive, there's nothing distinctively Catholic or Christian about the position he's taken up. He's just chosen to fall in line with what is orthodoxy among the middle class elite of the Western world. Um, and uh, so uh, what, this, what this suggests, and of course the original purpose of Christianity, the gospel, the, <clears throat> the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, that's something no one believes in anymore. The Catholics don't believe in it, I don't believe in it, nobody here believes in it. Uh, and nobody talks about it, and the Pope didn't talk about it on his recent visit, because it's, that's totally irrelevant to anything. Um, so, uh, what it seems to me is that we are witnessing the collapse of the Roman Catholic denomination. Um, and uh, it's going to take a hundred years to occur, but we're going to see it happening fairly rapidly. Um, and um, part of the reason for this is that the Catholic Church has nothing to offer. All right. All right. We're going to close this down with this thought. This is the first pope who has had the end of the influence of four major religious leaders, John, 
Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> the Catholic Church has got it just about right with Pope John Paul. Perhaps if we have a Pope George and a Pope Ringo, we'll really see some revolutionary change. With that, I'd like to wish you all a good night. Bye. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you learn, young man?